Institute. And the uh, agreement stipulated that this was renewed on a five-year basis unless it was canceled by either party. And it's never been canceled because we've been going out and doing management uh, almost every year or every other year we have a work day out there with a, uh, a group of conservation groups who kind of band together and we all go out and have a big work day, including the uh, Illinois Department of Natural Resources who all also participates in that work day. Um, so that has not been canceled. Also, Jill mentioned um, that in, uh, I think it was 1977, November 1st, 1977, the Greater Rockford Airport Authority passed a resolution um, to make every effort possible to preserve as a nature preserve the area outlined in red on the map attached to this resolution so long as it shall not interfere with the necessary operation of the airport. So I would like to say that basically this resolution is meaningless. Um, and they said that in a couple of other places um, that subject to terms and conditions as shall adequately provide for the present and future operations of the airport. But I'd like to say that I got a message from Mark Easter today, who used to be the Forest Preserve um, director here. And in his words, he said, this richly comp compensated, publicly appointed board is negligent in its duty and obligation to serve our community. So I, I wow. want to give you a little bit of background on what we have been doing. So about two or three years ago, uh, there was a consultation process with the DNR. Um, when any kind of large construction is happening like this, uh, they are required to do a consultation process to, with the state to see if there are any threatened and endangered species in the wake of their um, project. They had... Uh, an environmental consulting firm come out and do a survey. That firm did not find any of the plants that were supposed to be out there. And part of it has to do with the time of the year that they went out. Um, but this consultation process has, um, has kind of regulations attached to it. So they have to give public notice and hold a public hearing, which they did. The airport two or three years ago held a public hearing. But did any of us know about this? Did anybody know? If you did, raise your hand, please. We certainly didn't know. Evidently, they put a couple of uh, advertisements buried somewhere in a newspaper, and that fulfills the obligations of the public consultation process. So wow. one of, yeah, wow, I'll say wow. <laughs> so I sit on the Natural Resources Advisory Board to the Illinois Department of Natural Resources appointed by the governor. And I spoke to a person high up in IDNR and I said, I'm going to be bringing to this advisory board uh, a proposal for a more robust consultation process because none of us knew about this. And in fact, when the consultation process occurred with the IDNR, it was under our previous go governor who absolutely gutted the IDNR. So they probably didn't have the staff, but typically what happens in these consultation processes is the DNR in Springfield would send all the information to the local uh, heritage biologists and the local DNR staff. They never got it. So the IDNR themselves kind of fell down on the job. And yes, I understand it was difficult, but this particular consultation process was not handled properly because none of the IDNR local staff even knew about this and they should have reviewed this. So we are moving forward with that to make sure that this sort of thing doesn't happen again. Now, 
some people have said, you know, didn't you know about this a long time ago? So that's why I'm saying, no, we didn't know about this a long time ago. The consultation process was so old that when they actually started construction this year, uh, it had expired. So one of the heritage biologists here in Northern Illinois went out there and took a look and actually found the rusty patch bubble bee, which Barbara, Barbara uh, Williams is gonna talk to us about in a minute. Now the rusty patch bumblebee is federally endangered. So we called the US Fish and Wildlife and talked to them about it, DNR talked to them. So DNR, when they found out that there was the rusty patch bumblebee, they reopened the consultation process. And I said, oh, does that mean we get another public hearing? And they said, no. So, um, the other thing is that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife and the DNR have no way to protect a habitat. So for example, with the bumblebee, they can protect the bumblebee while it's foraging, but once it finishes foraging and goes dormant or whatever it does, um, hibernation, they have, there's no protection for it. It's like the uh, birds out west in the trees. As long as the bird was nesting in the tree in the nest, they could protect the bird. But once the bird left the nest, they could not protect the tree any longer, which is bogus. It's really, if you can't protect the habitat, then why bother in my thought? I mean, maybe there's possibility, but when you're destroying all the habitat around something, um, that doesn't really work. So we cannot basically fall on our swords to either IDNR or the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They, have, what I'm telling you tonight is that they have done everything that they can legally and there's nothing else that they can do. So it's up to us here. And they are encouraging of this group of people who are concerned, but they can't do anything more than they have done. So it's up to us. A Zoom meeting on Bell Prairie and Rockford that the um, Hello? airport's Hello? going to disturb. Could you please put yourself on mute? Thank you. Um, Oops. <laughs> so um, we're going to be talking tonight about what we can do. Uh, and I've been working with Lindsay Miller at the Illinois Environmental Council. Uh, she's put some stuff together for us, which she's going to talk about for um, connecting with our governor connecting with our local representatives. We're gonna be talking about how we can work with the clients at the airport. So for example, Jeff Bezos has pledged, I think it's a billion dollars, yeah. He pledged a billion dollars towards biodiversity, a billion dollars, that's a million million dollars, I think, right? to biodiversity and conservation, mostly in Africa and South America. And so we started a Twitter thing yesterday, said, hey, Jeff, <laughs> you're putting a facility on a really important rare prairie. How about starting here, where your bulldozers are going? So this is how, this is where we need to go. We need to work with the airport authority, local legislators, clients of the airport, and we're gonna be talking, and our governor, and we're gonna be talking about that because our governor has come out and said, 30 by 30 is uh, a, a priority for this governor. And I don't know how many of you know about this. I did write a piece in the newspaper. It's a global initiative to protect 30% of the world's natural resources by 2030. Then it was signed by President, the President Biden for the United States, 
and then our governor has signed it. So we are working with other states to protect 30% of our natural resources. So if we let this prairie go, it's like, okay, Mr. Governor, Mr. Pritzker, are you now going to take your words and make them mean something? So we need to hold him accountable and also his stance on climate change and native plants and what they do to sequester carbon and all those ecosystem services that they provide us. And so let's all kind of remember that we are not apart from nature, we are a part of nature. So it's like cutting off our arm or finger. So we've been working kind of behind the scenes. We had a meeting with the airport authority and IDNR that uh, I attended was a Zoom meeting. They gave us the NEPA documents and some other documents and showed us, told us what they were doing. And we talked about the consultation process. Uh, and we were supposed to have another meeting tomorrow morning. Uh, the IDNR just canceled it late this afternoon because they couldn't go out on the prairie. They were gonna reschedule it. But there's a lot of other things we wanna do. So. Uh, we're going to try and see if we can. Some of us can still meet with the airport authority tomorrow morning. Yes, sir. When did you have your meeting with the airport board? We had a Zoom meeting. It wasn't yeah. the board. It yeah. was. It, it was about two weeks ago. It was with their engineer, their who was their site design planner and the IDOT representative and the uh, DNR representative from the consultation process. Who's the DNR representative? I can get you that name. I don't. We need to know names. Yeah, I can give you that. Happy to do that. Thank you. As I'm turning 70, sometimes names don't stick. <laughs> but I have that all written down, so. I can get you that. 70. Exactly where is the road? That, that, that red line, north, south red line, no. is that the road? What, where is the uh, road? The red line is the boundary. Okay, where's the, where's the road? You got that, Joe? Is it right through the heart of that yellow thing or just crosses it? No, it just crosses it in an area that's. Uh, I, I spoke to the contractor out there that moving the earth and he said the area that they're working in is extremely degraded and it's basically a garbage dump from years and years of fill and garbage. It's They've been dumping founders out there for yeah. five decades. Yeah, so the road part, the DNR said they can still work there because that's not the high quality area. And it's full of garbage. You don't have the slide I gave you? With Matt? I don't have it in the PowerPoint. Where are they so this is this is uh, do you have a you don't have the other map? No? Okay. So this is the expansion place and what they're proposing to do is put a building, which we think is the Amazon building, right on top of it. So one of, the, one of the things that we were hoping to get tomorrow is the full site plans uh, to, sh to show exactly where all of the different construction is going, where they're not putting anything so that we can say, oh, do we have some alternatives? So in their NEPA documents, in their NEPA document, they had alternatives. They had several alternative sightings and they just said they're not feasible. So, so we're having the Illinois Environmental Council review that NEPA document to see where are those alternatives and what are the actual reasons for not being feasible. So for example, if something's more expensive, maybe they could do that you know, just spend a little bit more money. So we're having those plans all reviewed. Um, every single 
alternative is being reviewed and analyzed. And we're hoping to get some more plans for the whole site plan from the airport soon. Does anybody have any questions about that? Yeah. Can you just draw a picture like close to the screen where the road is or the end where the building is? Because that's where the site plan is. Yes. Yeah. 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 Pointer. So the pointer won't show up on this screen because it refracts off of it because it's a TV. The building is in this area. Oh, no. right. And it goes over the arrow or just do it with your finger in real time. The building goes over and over that yellow part. It goes into the yellow. And the road goes around it. I'm just having trouble visualizing. Yeah. Yeah, I think we'll we'll get a better idea. We were hoping to get a better idea tomorrow when we get a set of plans. So at the moment, um, this is what we have for now. Oh. So that, that big green swath that's like the shape of New Hampshire? The road is coming off of the bypass and it'll come up across and go right across here uh, up to this uh, big building that's not on this map, which is the Rock Valley College building right here. So the road Valley College. this way and up there. The Rock Valley College is actually where the red and yellow lines is. It's like a white building on the right side. We'll go to the right. Right there. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Or yeah, that's why way. I said it. This way. Yeah. Okay. All right, sorry. No, those are there. Those are already there. So the aerial photo underneath, that's what's what's there now. What are we even talking about now? Can you see the map on the screen? Yeah, Carrie, we can. We can see the map. Okay, thanks. It, it was shared earlier um, that the road building has proceeded right to the boundary of the prairie right now. Can you change your map that? So see the red and the yellow beach, uh, right? Right here. And expand the uh, so like it's all the way up here. Like they've already got this whole section out right here. Will you all make the official plans available public like on the Facebook or public page tomorrow when you get them so that everyone in this room or anyone at all can see the whole document? So I think did we put the NEPA document link on there? Wait, I don't know that it's been posted yet. No. We can do that. It's got a whole series of stuff. Oh, but, oh, and, and then when we get more, as soon as we get more information, we'll put it in. That's just that be tomorrow, and like the actual like plans for the project, the alternatives, and whatnot. The alternatives are in the document. Yes. Okay, and then I just wanted to clarify. So the red is the bounds of the construction. So of the yellow, which is the but the it's Belleville Prairie, everything to the left of the red is going to be destroyed. Basically, there's going to be a building, a building on top of it, literally, or is it going to be like a road going through part of it? Or there's a road going through part of it, and there's a building on top of it. So Show the, the fucking other picture. They have another picture. Why won't, wouldn't that be in here? You're not on mute. We have to. Oh <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure they didn't do creative alternatives. What can we expect from the most important? Yeah, and what's and our vision of what it should be like? Right, and we're going to offer to work with them on that. Yeah. So let's keep going with our meeting. Barbara um, Williams is going to talk about the Rusty Patch Bumblebee, and we have a, a video to watch first. Do you, do you have the video? I it. Oh, no, we do. Oh, okay. Because if it doesn't, it doesn't work, I can bring it without it. <laughs> You know Barbara Williams. Yeah. I've been I've been messing with the rusty patch bumblebees for about ten years now in this area. I've been a big champion of them. 
And uh, I guess I'm the closest thing we have locally to a rusty patch bumblebee expert. I wore my bees. <laughs> and so I, I have a very short video. See, it's only four and a half minutes long that I put together just to give you a little grounding on the rusty patch bumblebee. So let her rip. <laughs> This is available on YouTube. There's also a long version on YouTube. So you can really dive in at home if you want to. Hundreds of species of native bees can be found living in the area of Rockford and North Central Illinois. We are especially fortunate that among them is a beautiful and rare bumblebee, the rusty patched bumblebee. Historically, it was one of the most common bumblebees throughout much of the Eastern US and the Midwest. But in recent years, the rusty patch bumblebee has rapidly disappeared from much of its former range. No one is certain why these bees are in trouble, but it is likely to be due to the overuse of pesticides, changes in land use, habitat fragmentation, disease and competition from managed bee colonies, and even climate change. This rusty patch bumblebee was captured and photographed in Rockford in 2009. That was the first sighting in a long time, and it was when we realized that the species was hanging on in this area. Searchers began looking for them and finding them in remnant prairies, prairie restorations, even in gardens and backyards where nectar-rich flowers were blooming. They have since been found living in various places from Peoria to the Chicago suburbs, up to Madison and Minneapolis, here and there widely through Northern Illinois. This map from the Xerces Society shows the historical range in light gray and the estimated current range in dark gray. The current range shown here may be quite optimistic as the sightings map from iNaturalist shows a much smaller range of confirmed sightings. More information over a longer span of time is needed the overall decline of the rusty patch bumblebee was so rapid and so poorly understood that in 2017, the species was officially listed as an endangered species by the US government. That's an important step for the conservation of this rare bee because it draws attention to the plight of the species and also makes funds available for the improvement and restoration of habitat to support these populations. Our community is in a position to conserve these beautiful and valuable pollinators. This is a conservation challenge where individual people can make a real difference. Rusty patch bumblebees only need a few things to flourish. It goes without saying that bumblebees need to be protected from pesticides, sprays and systemic pesticides that kill pest insects, also kill all sorts of other pollinators including butterflies, moths, smaller bees, and bumblebees. Their nests must be allowed to survive. Each queen that lives through the winter has only one chance to start a new colony. The workers that she raises in the early summer help her care for the eggs and larvae throughout the summer, raising more workers, and then raising a new generation of males and young queens. In early fall, those males and queens mate with males and queens from nearby colonies. Workers and males die when the weather turns cold and only the young queens hibernate through the winter and start the cycle over again the next spring. Lastly, they need plenty of flowers, rich in nectar and pollen. Even a small garden can provide these valuable food resources for pollinators. Native plants are the most useful to these bees because they've evolved together for thousands of years. Here are some helpful websites to get you started on bumblebee watching. Thanks for watching and for helping to save our wonderful bumblebees. <laughs>
Okay. It's going to take a couple of minutes. So rusty patch bumblebee is, to me, is a wonderful insect, but it's more than that. It's, and I'm sorry, I'm reading from notes because if I don't, I'll just ramble on for 20 minutes. About it. This is the only way I can keep myself on track. It's a poster child for the hundreds of other bees and all the other insects that are suffering population declines. We are focusing here on the rusty patch bumblebee, but there are moths, butterflies, fireflies, beetles, grasshoppers and crickets, and other bees out there too. What else lives in that prairie? The truth is we don't know. And we don't understand what is there. and We don't understand the connections between those creatures. We don't know how rusty patch bumblebees choose their sites to overwinter. We don't know how they choose their sites to nest. We don't understand their overall decline. There's a whole lot we don't understand, including how they respond to disruption. But we do know that maintaining the habitat is the only way to conserve a species. If the habitat's gone, the creatures that depend on it are also gone. Whether the habitat is destroyed now or in November or next spring, doesn't really matter. When it's gone, it's gone. The queen bees emerging in the spring will find no suitable nesting locations. Well, they may find no suitable nesting locations. And things like black-billed cuckoos that migrate back to this area that have nested at Bellbow Prairie may arrive from migration and find their habitat so altered that they'll choose not to nest there at all. Will they go somewhere else and nest? Maybe not. We don't know. So you can lose the entire population that's in an area like that very, very quickly. You just heard me say that the queens are the only bees that live through the winter. They have one chance to start a new nest. If we lose one generation, of queens in that population, it's over for that population. They're gone. They don't get a second chance to come around and reproduce again. So there's a bottleneck there in the winter. Rockford, since I moved here 30 years ago, has had a very negative self-image. People who've lived here all their lives have told me what a terrible place this is to live. <laughs> this is the kind of thing that feeds that negative image. Airport is part of our community. And it's, if a community thoughtlessly destroys things that are of beauty and value, then it's not a place people are going to feel good about. It's not a place that I want to live. There are ways to have growth without ruining the very things that make our hometown special. I want to live in a community that values, conserves, and protects its cultural history, its environmental assets, and its unique legacy of connections between the people and the land. Thank you for hearing me out. I have another obligation I've got to buzz off to. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Don Miller is going to talk about the value of a prairie. Uh, before I do that, I just want to add something on to what Barbara had said about this relationship of insects and such to a prairie. 10, 15 years ago, I was at Harlem Hills Prairie and uh, ran into Jim Waker. Maybe some of you folks know Jim. And I told this story out in the prairie after the board meeting last week that he was looking for. And I emailed Jim the other day to see if he could give me the name so I'm not going to be able to pass the name on for you. But it was a caterpillar that was disappearing. And uh, it feeds only on lead plant that is three years, the leaves are three years older. And because our burn rotations sometimes are more than the three, that these things are disappearing. And uh, if it tries to eat on a leaf that's younger than three years, it, the, the leaf is a toxin in it that kills its caterpillar. And it's that kind of relationship that just wows me at the old age I am about how cool these prairies are and how important they are. I was asked to, to approach the, the topic of the value of prairies. And I'm thinking pretty sure that if you're going to come to a meeting at 5 o'clock, um, your value system of prairies is probably pretty intact. So I'm speaking to 
the, the choir, but I also know that the choir can sing louder. So I'm still going to go on with my, my plan here. How many, show of hands, how many got to one of our prairie, local prairie remnants this, this summer? How many returned and took somebody with them? How many in the last five years got to the Belleville Prairie? Great, great. Well, the numbers that we're using these days is there's 2,300 acres of remnant prairie left in Illinois, the size a little less than Rock Cut State Park. 22 million acres was Illinois. We've lost 60% of that, one one hundred percent of prairies. To quote George Fell, nothing becomes valuable until it's rare. Prairies are rare. We, I think, are very fortunate in this area. We have some very nice high quality prairies. To name a few, Harlem Hills, Searles, Freeport Prairie, Wilson Prairie, Beach Prairie, others as well as Bells and Prairie, each unique and special in their own way. I believe that prairie is kind of an acquired taste. One can go out to the Pacific coast and immediately your jaw drops at the beauty that is out there. I think the same is true of the mountainous areas. Prairies for most take a few visits. Finding a deeper understanding and appreciation of the beauty and the depth before we fall in love with them. I also believe not only are you getting values, you're getting belief systems here, but I believe that saving a prairie is more of a moral issue than it is an economic one. But let's look first at some of those functions and economics of, of the dollars and cents of it all. Prairies increase water infiltration and reduce erosion. Uh, the reduced sediment, pollution, runoff increases water quality. Prairies store lots of carbon. Many species depend on these uh, ecosystems for survival. They provide rare native habitat for plants, birds, butterflies, insects, reptiles, and wildlife that only live on prairies. Some prairies contain deep, rich soil with uh, dense, tangled roots. They are perfectly adapted to our climate and hopefully our changing climate. The Bell Bowl Prairie does all of that. And I can list endangered species and rare plants and animals found there, but it's truly the prairie ecosystem that is also endangered. Leonardo da Vinci began painting, yeah, where's he gonna go with this? The Mona Lisa in 1503, and it was found in a studio when he died in 1519. Some things that made his in total, he spent only four years of total time on that project. It would give Vinci a little credit here. He's 51 when he started paying this. So he had five decades of developing the skills and the knowledge uh, to present this gift uh, that he gave humanity, his masterpiece. During World War II, the Mona Lisa was singled out as the most endangered artwork in the Louvre. It was evacuated to various locations in France's countryside, returning to the museum in 1945, only after the piece had been secured. Its worth is estimated at $850 million. We certainly would not even consider ruining something of that value, that value and uniqueness for any reason, would we? I'll come back to the Mona Lisa story in a bit. When we talk about economic value of prairie, I think it's a difficult thing. It's like asking you when you're 10 years old, what's the economic value of your mom? Okay, I'm sure there's a dollar figure that we can figure out washing dishes, cleaning clothes, taking care of us. But that is not why we protect and love our moms. And I think the same is true of prairies. Andrea Wallace Noble here in the front row has done a fine job of complying a thread of facts and general info in the Save the Bell Old Prairie Facebook. And on it, from the Defenders of Wildlife Benefit Transfer Database, it stated that environmental service provided by prairies equal about $316,000 per acre, totaling near $8 million then for the Bell Bowl Prairie. But now we go back to the Mona Lisa. If this masterpiece is worth $850 million, only took four years to paint, compared to Bell Bowl Prairie, which is a place full of complex relationships between soil, weather, plant, animals, fungi, geology, and so much more, it took 9,000 years to, in the making. The Belleville Prairie is as unique to this world as anything can possibly be. 
what is the real economic value of a prairie then? If something that took four years to, years to paint by one person is valued at 850 million, and it doesn't hold carbon, it doesn't hold water, it doesn't support any life, then the Belleville Prairie uniqueness has to be valued at hundreds times that. The masterpiece it's of correct. masterpieces. L. Leopold, the great professor, naturalist and writer of the San County Almanac, wrote an essay called The Prairie Birthday. That I'm pretty sure most people in this room are familiar with. Leopold writes of a small cemetery visits with a single compass plant, also known as Silphium, is growing in the corner. It's blooming. It's July. Leopold thinks that this sunflower-like prairie plant might be the last remaining one in the western half of Dean County, Wisconsin. Leopold states this about relationships. We grieve only for what we know, and therefore the prairies continue to die. Leopold continues in the essay and writes one of my favorite quotes, what a thousand acres of silphium looked like when they tickled the bellies of the buffalo is a question never again to be answered. And then he stuck this on there, and perhaps not even asked. Think of that statement. We in this room will never witness that scene. And only because Leopold wrote it out for us do we dream of what it must have looked like. Will the next generation only hear stories of Belleville Prairie? The nickname of the Illinois is the Prairie State. The North American Prairie is one of the most endangered ecosystems on Earth. Most have been destroyed in the last 120 and 150 years. But for us gathered here tonight, know that it's still being threatened. I've had discussions on something we were calling diminishing natural areas through generations. You have probably heard the old metaphor about the frog thrown into the hot water will jump right out, but the frog in the water as it warms up doesn't realize the change. Well, we're that frog in, in, in slow change, not noticing those changes. We only live through the losses that occur during our lifetime. And we don't realize, and that's only if we, if we have our eyes open. And I hear some of the environmental elders that are in this room tonight talk about natural areas that are now gone forever. I wasn't able to see them because I was born too late. We are still losing them. And so the next generation will be poor, not knowing what they have missed out on. George, George Fell again says, we are the generation, the last stage of the conquest of natural areas. Nothing is being saved except what is deliberately being set aside. The people of the distant past had no concept that we would have the ability to destroy all that they witnessed. We are the only ones in the whole history of the human race to be faced with this situation. What will the history say of us? As humans, we've always tried to turn prairies into something else. We plow them up, raise crops, we cover them with cement and blacktop and build places to live and travel. We can come up with all kinds of replacements for prairie. However, I think it's clear that the reason most prairies are destroyed is their true value. value is not realized. We're always going to be competing against economics of alternatives, cropland, houses, roads and buildings and airports. Almost always those alternatives went out with the economic value of, is, is considered. It's easy to dismiss grasslands as unimportant when you only see them as wastelands of grass that stand between you and some type of development. We only protect the things we love and understand. And that's what's going on at Belleville. There's a lack of understanding, appreciation, what they have. In conclusion, Belleville Prairie needs all of our help that we realize the true value of, value of these prairies. We all reap the benefits of beautiful natural areas that are so often written about in so many ways. We need to start giving our gift back to the prairie as you all are doing by attending this program tonight. I have, as many of you have, spent loads of money and time putting natives in my yard. And we know the value of doing that for pollinators as an oasis to connect those special few natural areas left. And I am all about that. But I will beg you, for every hour you put in in your own yard, to volunteer to spend some time and money with the Natural Land Institute, the Boone County Conservation District, the Forest Preserves of Winnebago County, Severson Dells, Northwest Illinois Audubon, and so many others. 
for protecting and restoring some of these natural areas, learning a deeper understanding and appreciation from their staff, and then spread that word to others. Let's work together to preserve these valuable places long before the bulldozers show up. They all need our help so desperately. So once we finally save Bell Bowl Prairie, there will be need for volunteers there as well. So I will look forward to seeing you out there. Thank you. I'm going to see if you'll speak in Quan. I'd like to have him remember, but he won't. So next, next on the agenda, we have Lindsay Miller. And Lindsay, I apologize. I have I was your email it. name on here, which perhaps is your maiden name. But I don't know if you want to share your screen. Yeah. Or how would you would like to do that? Yeah, I'll share my screen. I think I have the ability. Yeah, uh, Carrie's known me a long time. So Lindsay Miller is my maiden name. I'm Lindsay Keeney now. Okay. Have been for five years. So I am the conservation director at the Illinois Environmental Council. That happens to be the same amount of time that I have been conservation director there at IEC. So at the Illinois Environmental Council, we do a lot of advocacy um, for a suite of uh, different environmental issues. I get to work on, I tell everyone, I get to work on the fun stuff, the conservation work, the sustainable agriculture work. Um, but I, uh, I know Carrie talked a lot about the uh, things that are happening sort of behind the scenes, uh, reviewing the NEPA documents, uh, looking at how we change this review process, how we make DNR more um, transparent and, and up these public process pieces. So I think there's a lot of angles to work this. Uh, but the one I want to offer you guys is is something that we can kind of do right now and take action today, tomorrow, um, ASAP. So I'm going to throw this link in the chat. Um, and then I'm going to share my screen. So this is an action alert. It's set up. You can go online. Um, hang on. I'm sharing my screen right now. Share. Okay. So this is an action alert. You can go to this link. You can share this link on the Facebook page. I want to, you guys are doing a great job with uh, setting that Facebook page up, getting those facts out. Um, I have never been to Melville Prairie and I sincerely hope that after all of this effort, I get the chance to come up uh, and visit. So this is the action alert. You click the link, you go right here. You can type in your information here in these boxes. It has a quick breakdown of the issue, what you can do. This is targeted at uh, Governor Pritzker uh, because anyone in the state can take this action. So you don't need to be in the district or live nearby Bell Bowl. Um, you can be anywhere in the state, outside the state even. Um, he's really gonna care about constituents though. Uh, so if you're in Illinois, you can forward this to any of your friends, you can link it on Facebook. It has a letter here that it will initiate a letter um, using this text. And a neat thing you can do is you can click right in here if you have a personal story you want to add about how, how much you enjoy the prairie or whatever piece speaks to you. Um, you can go in here and add or edit. Then when you click take action, it uh, sends that letter and reaches out to the governor on your behalf. Um, Carrie, I know you had asked me about uh, contacting individual legislators, senators, and representatives. And uh, I had talked to Jen and Colleen, and they thought that the governor was the best audience here. But if you all are interested in making noise, you are always more than welcome to copy and paste this information out of here. You can email that directly to your legislators. Um, you could call them on the phone and speak with them. If you I'm sure you guys are all aware of who your legislators are, but on the off chance that you don't, you can always just Google, find my legislator, Illinois. This page will come up. You can put in your um, address, put your address in right here, bring your legislators up and you can click on their names, go into their profiles and pull their email addresses and phone numbers if those are available. Um, 
your senators won't have email addresses available because it's just a weird um, <clears throat> niche thing that Illinois doesn't offer uh, the senator email addresses, but all of your representatives will have them right here under email. So that is just a really, really quick and dirty uh, process, some things that you can do. I will put all of this information out on that Facebook page. Maybe that's the best way to follow up. Um, you're also, if you represent an organization that has a membership, um, let me get back over here to the actual alert. You are more than welcome to use this link, link to this in an email to your members. Um, you can get folks to take action that way. We've got some um, social media graphics that I sent to Carrie. Maybe she can help distribute those, but I'll put them on that Facebook too. Uh, and yeah, I think I'll stop sharing my screen if anyone has questions. Um, that, that's what we have for you today uh, to kind of get some immediate action happening and make some noise. Thank you so much, Lindsay. Does anyone have any questions for Lindsay? You can post them in the chat if you want to. And then, uh, Lindsay, I'll have you watch the chat so we can keep going here. And then if uh, no anyone, problem. okay, thank you. So we will continue with our agenda. So it just to further discuss what some of our action um, plans are going forward, and I will let Carrie jump in at any time, um, but there really are four key stakeholders in this, right? We've got the Chicago airports, we've got their board and staff, um, the customers of the airport, Amazon, UPS. I actually had somebody um, contact me who um, wanted to remain anonymous, but has a connection or a conflict with the airport that suggested we reach out to D.B. Shaker and Senator International who are European companies that perhaps have greater policies than us and might be able to put some leverage and pressure on, on the airport and the board. So um, I will have some of their, you can see it on the back of the agenda. Um, I have that link and we'll make, um, or at least some ways that you can reach out to them and we'll make that um, PDF available in the, the Facebook group as well. Um, legislators and the governor are local legislators, Dave Bella, Maurice West, um, Senator Stottleman, Steve Stottleman. Um, so those contact information for those um, legislators are on the back of that form too. Other conservation organizations, the DNR, the two contacts for the DNR for their press um, or their public relations are on the back of that. If you've been using Christopher Lay as the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, please stop um, contacting him. He's not our regional rep and I apologize. Um, I received that name from someone um, to reach out to him as the endangered species uh, person for our area. He is not the correct person. And um, I asked someone to apologize to him for me, but the correct US Fish and Wildlife regional person is on that form as well. Um, outreach. So the best way to outreach is through phone calls. So if you're gonna reach out to a legislator, phone call absolutely is the best way to get any kind of impact or um, any kind of engagement with your representative. Emails are fine, they have contact forms on their websites, I believe I um, posted the contact forms as well. Email, um, like I said, mail a letter or postcard. I had a bunch of postcards printed with um, the Save Bell Toll Carry on the front. I have not received them yet, but I have 500 coming. So anyone locally, if they, um, I'll leave them at the NLI office, you can stop down there and pick them up. Social media, if you're a social media person, Please um, use the hashtag Save Belleville Prairie. Um, tag any of those um, organizations um, that we've talked about as like, these are the people we're gonna do outreach to, whether you're on Twitter and you're gonna tag Prisker or any of the legislators of the city of Rockford or Amazon or Jeff Bezos or UPS, um, definitely start tagging um, and bringing some awareness. Social media has uh, influence um, in some ways, and hopefully we can take advantage of that. And then lastly, um, because the date is different than we thought, I think we all thought November 10th was our deadline, well, there's still one more board meeting that we can go to. So I think um, as many people that can go to that and 
present to the board again or read something to the board again to get their voice across at least that's probably the only way you're going to get um, in touch with the airport board because they have responded to none of my emails um, but there's an opportunity there to speak um, and before we go to public comments I just wanted to some of you may have seen this great video I'll wait for it to load up here um, but this is a video of George Bell and um, his advocacy for Belleville Prairie. And they said, where'd Charlie go? Did he leave already? No. Oh. Charlie made this video who he was in our audience earlier. We in this generation are right at the turning point from wilderness conditions where man lived with nature to goodness knows what the future is going to bring. We're at the last stage of the conquest over the natural world. It's going on in the tropical rainforest now at a tremendous rate. These things are being destroyed just systematically, totally. And nothing's being saved except what's deliberately being set aside by somebody's efforts. And uh, it's, it's a unique situation. Uh, nobody in the past has been concerned. I mean, in the past, distant past, no, there was no concept that these things would be destroyed. Nobody in the future is going to have the opportunity. We are the only ones in the history of whole history of the human race that are faced with this situation. The Bell Bull Prairie, right next to the Rockford Airport, was to be destroyed. The airport needed fill for a runway. The fell stepped in. And though it was a struggle, part of the prairie was saved. was sort of David and Goliath sort of situation. He was a person that came out there against the bulldozer, stood up, and uh, the newspapers got a great deal of footage from it. Um, it was an appealing story because the bulldozers were right there in the background and we were out there standing. At a pleading, and of course, the newspapers couldn't have asked for anything more. I think throughout we felt that urgency. It's been such a, as so though we were running from one brush fire to another to save an area. And it's given us a great deal of uh, determination to, and persistence to go ahead. It could be very sad to see some of these areas that we loved, destroyed, and many of them were, but then we'd go right ahead. We'd go right ahead. We'd work on what we could do. I've found through many years of experience and countless examples that if one person is determined that something is going to be saved, it has to be saved, it's going to be saved, it can be done, it will be done. Uh, if there isn't that determination, it doesn't happen. So before we go to public comments and questions, Carrie, did you have anything more that you wanted to add? Um, I think it's also important for people to write letters to the editor. Yes. Um, with their unique perspectives on what they want to say. Yeah, it's and kind of flood that, those letters over the next few weeks. Yes, I agree. So definitely letters to the editor. Um, we're going to put some scripts out and some call scripts out, but feel free, like Lindsay mentioned, cut and paste um, from their um, action alert and use that verbiage too. Um, but we'll have some more out there that you can access. I noticed when I was Google searching Belleville Prairie the other day that there's a map of it now and you can leave reviews. 
So people should go out there and start leaving reviews so people see those comments. Um, you can rate it, give it a five star rating, and then like write ever whatever you want about <laughs> Belleville Prairie. Um, it's going to like then just, you know pump up in the, the Google search. Um, so that's something else that I thought about when I saw that the other day. Um, but yeah, I think um, public comments. And we, we also have one other thing we wanted to share oh. with you that Don Miller. Don Miller has agreed to help us um, because we're we need more assistance with this. And he's going to be helping to coordinate a lot of public events, press things. Um, and so he has an email with us now. It's dmiller at naturalland.org. I did update. Oh, it's on there. Okay. So, so um, you know, every, everybody gets these great ideas. Uh, send them all to Don. He'll kind of put them all together and start. And then he'll be meeting with us very regularly. We'll go over things. And we're trying to also, um, Jennifer, we wanted to create a group, uh, a kind of coordinating group. Did you want to talk about that? Uh, sure, sure. I think Don is going to be the leader of that group. <laughs> right? That's your role. Um, so Don is our leader. Um, I think there's going to be a, four, a small a small group of four people that um, will work together to try and to bring these all these ideas together because some of us know some information and some of us know other information and just trying to bring it all together so we can um, collectively share that with one voice and then Don can communicate that all for us. Um, and that is kind of where we're at going forward. I saw Zach's hand up over there. Yep, I just wanted to um, bring up how, uh, first of all, everything that we've talked about so far is, is super, super important, like the, this outreach that we can all do. Um, the one thing that I thought about just asking you, Jennifer, if you knew um, for the October 28th board meeting, uh, the, the airport's board meeting, the greater, the airport authorities board. Um, I don't know if you remember, well, of course you do. The, the sign-in uh, process? Yeah, the sign-in process was yes. goofy, so you had to sign up prior to. Right. right, so they said they were going to change that, but I don't trust them because they may expect us to come again. If you go to the airport board meeting, get in that room 15 minutes before the board meeting starts, fill out your speaker form. It's on the back wall on this like little um, council table. And I might go out there just to grab one to make photocopies to make sure that there's enough forms to go around because I feel like um, they might expect us to come and maybe there's not going to be enough forms. Um, but I say we take up all the time that we can of uh, them at that board and let's get those forms in early. So it sounds like we're limited to five speakers. Great. Great. No, the, the normal board, if you were to sign in at the proper time, was five speakers. Oh. They allowed us three speakers because. So many people have to Yeah, continue to prioritize speaker. Yeah, I didn't catch that. Thank you for noticing that. So yeah, five total speakers then, unfortunately. Um, we only got three that time. But yeah, let's prioritize um, five speakers. Um, and and go, we'll send that information to Don. And we can coordinate the messages so that yeah. we get a, yeah. Yeah, so maybe there's a full story to tell because you only get three minutes. So uh, if we got five speakers, we got 15 minutes to tell a full story. So maybe the next person picks up where the next the other person left off to get that full story across. But we can talk about that and work through it. Any other comments or questions? Yes. If I'm hearing this right, it's basically like a set from Amazon, is what it sounds like to me. So another important thing you can use for action is maybe Trying to avoid our research of Amazon in general. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Connection. Yeah. I suppose if enough of us collectively locally did it, it might have an impact, but it would take everyone in Rockford to do that. It's not a solution, but it's something you could recognize because this does have its focus. Yeah, I canceled my Amazon Prime membership a while ago. I don't know how long ago. It's something Bezos did or said, and I'm like, I'm done. So, yes. I have a, a different alternative approach, and that is if they're using bond money to build the road across there, they have to, by law, post that they're doing that and leave it up for 30 days. And they also have to uh, see, 
they have to do one other thing to assure that they can use the bond money. That is, uh, have a hearing, and at that hearing, vote to do that action. So I, I had a couple people searching today to see if they could find that in the park district. I mean, the park the airport district board minutes and they couldn't find any mention of either one of those actions in the minutes at all. Uh, supposedly, there was a little discussion in January. Uh, that was after the December meeting was canceled. So that if they didn't follow the law doing that, then you can stop them from using that money to build that road. But I don't know for sure. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> we we had it to the minutes and every and all that to uh, that might be find an it. FOIA request. Yeah. And, uh, I, I wanted to go back to the Amazon comment because I think that's kind of important because I think that we're looking at this from a logical perspective, which is really, I mean, that's the heart of the issue, but. There is a social and a cultural and economic aspect to this thing with Amazon. And um, when uh, you were talking about valuing the prairie, I was sitting over here, um, wise guy, but I was I was gonna ask you a question, like if you could value a double prairie, like how many Bitcoins do you think it would be worth? And like how many do you think Elon Musk would wanna offer Jeff Bezos to keep him from, you know, harming the prairie? But like, I think there's other ways to like, Amazon is an issue here, and like um, I came here from Chicago today, so I also wanted to ask, like, what can I, and I, I represent a group, and we're interested in bringing people out here. I was thinking of doing like a plant walk every single weekend for the next eight weeks or something, and anyone can come. Like, what can we do? Well, you have to be careful with that. Yeah. We were there late one night, and airport <laughs> security showed up and said we were trespassing, and that's a arrest arrestable offense. It was. Oh, yeah. I highly suggested that we could be arrested for being there. Right. It's a it's a felony. So how are people going there right now? Because I'd like to go visit as well. Um, you're trespassing. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I would recommend tan clothes, camouflage. <laughs> park. So like on the airport map where you saw RBC where there's parking lot, park there, they're gonna notice you parking on Cessna Drive. I think that's how we probably were seeing because so much of us our cars were down on Cessna perhaps. Right. So park in the parking lots and then walk down from the hill, like don't come down the road because I don't know. And they could be have more security out there now because they know oh. we're interested in it. There used to be regular walks out there when I searched, did some history search in our newspaper archives. There was regular walks hosted by Mississippi, by NLI, by the Forest Preserve. There were regular walks out at Belleville Prairie. Unfortunately, I don't think that we could actually schedule something like that and announce it. I think you'd have to go in there and not announce it before you go. I'm not a lawyer. We need Barbara to answer the question. I was hoping he was going to be here tonight. So did I. That's probably thought you cannot be trespassing. That's probably Security tells you you're trespassing. That's an airport. I don't care. That, that they can have restricted areas. Yeah. They can have restricted areas. That, that's all changed in 911. You can't trespass that is part of Homeland Security. So that's why a lot of those tours and things have been canceled. Over oh. here. Interesting. Yeah. 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 It's all from 911. Yeah. 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 I thought yeah. the Mississippi Airport Authority was going to be working out there. Like, it's not going to be annual. It's so that comment, we uh, since I've, I've worked for NLI since 2015, we've gone out every year to do some work, and we've honestly never approached the. Uh, we had talked to the airport about uh, controlled burns on the ferry, but we've never really informed them that we were going to go treat weeds. Um, it's just a service that we were providing, and I, you know, it's regrettable that we weren't in more contact with them up until this point, and I, I want to commit to. You know, being more transparent with them as we move as we move forward. Um, to the to your question about getting access to the prairie, I did see that you can contact uh, Seth Nigren, who works for the airport. Um, he's their operations manager, um, and request permission to enter the prairie. Um, 
so that's one uh, way that we could try to gain access. I don't I don't know how willing they're going to be to grant that access. Well, yeah, but I'm just wondering if like a group from the University of Chicago or some of the people that I'm talking about, or someone from the Smart Institute of Chicago, School of the Arts, or right. Western right. University. So I, I will post on the Safe Bell Facebook page um, yeah. his contact information, and uh, if I can find that quote of uh, uh, please, you know, for, or for permission or whatever, yeah. to, to have that there for people so that they can access that. Yeah, like a platform to go over. Sure. Right. Right. Well, <clears throat> through the head police officer of the park district, Theo Glover, he was informed by the airport police that they were told by Mike Dunn that if I ever set foot on there, I was to be arrested for trespassing. <laughs> okay? And I believe those people. <laughs> Don't go. So maybe ask permission. Don't let's I view mean, camouflage sounded good to me, but <laughs> so, so maybe not. <laughs> and if you're gonna go camouflage, not just Chicago bond fund. <laughs> <laughs> it might be really I mean it might be helpful like buying bonds to get out of jail for the rest of the past year. Yeah, this could be considered as justice. Yes. Uh, yeah, I understand. Um yeah. uh, I'm someone that lived near the uh, M tool fire, so I'm kind of a cynic here. And I think that everybody should look in different um, forms of direct action. I believe that we all have a moral obligation to defend the earth as much as we can. And coming from a young person, I don't know if I have 50 years from now. You know, I don't know what the climate disaster is going to do. Am I even going to have a stable area to live in? You know, I don't really give a shit anymore about asking permission for things. This is the earth. Nobody even mentioned anything about indigenous people whose land this is stolen from anyway. And Amazon, a corporation, doesn't give a shit about anything we do. You think that chemical gave a shit that they had a chemical fire near a river? Water. We are made of water. These things need to be defended by any means necessary. And now, I'm not trying to be ableist, but anybody who is able-bodied, I highly suggest looking into different forms of direct action. You know, getting arrested, yeah, that sucks. And like someone said, look into different forms of bond and all these other things. You know, I mean, like, putting the economic value on something that is natural is the most disturbing thing to me. End industrial civilization because it is actively destroying where we come from. I am the earth, the earth is me. Any act of aggression against the earth is an act of aggression against myself and all of you. So, you know, you can try different forms. Look at line three. People lock themselves to machines and they got federal charges. They got tortured. And what is Enbridge gonna do? They're gonna start pumping oil through that thing. This weekend. So you think, you know, going to your politicians and asking them, oh, please, you know, don't, don't, don't build something here. You think they're going to care? I said I'm a cynic, you know, and I'm sorry. I'm not trying to ring on anybody's parade here. You got high hopes for anything. But the earth is being fucking destroyed. All right. So, Young man sounds like I do. Have to have a Rachel Carson. Yeah, you know, I'm, and, and I see maybe a few other young people here. You know, where are all the other young people? Why, don't, why, are, why isn't there more people here? Why don't people care? This is no way to tell the guys jack shit. But nobody <laughs> talks about it. Exactly. No. That's the problem, too. And this is just a small little piece of land. So, I mean, I appreciate your comments. And I, I think a valid point, and that this group may not be going to do certain measures that you may be, that people like you should step in at the appropriate time, which you may know. And that, yes, right? Well, you we said you're from, uh, from Chicago. We got to try everything. That are, yeah, I, I do. I think yeah. you should try everything. But just placing all your hopes into one thing, 
You know, I see this all the time, time and time again. You phone Zach's, contact your politician, all these things. These people don't care. They just kiss face. They want to get elected. They don't give a shit about the earth. Yeah, yeah, Jack, why don't you go out there and get arrested and they'll make the news? Oh, <laughs> me, I'm so sure. Don't smell my tongue, you're coming. So, you know, I've had lots of people contact me and it's always been in the back of my mind that if nothing happened, that there would be a protest out there. So it's definitely, it's not, I've not, not thought of it is what I'm trying to say. And I've had plenty of people that said they will be out there standing with me in front of the bulldozer. So, I welcome you to join us when it comes to that. Because <laughs> it could come to that, definitely. Jennifer, I yes. have one question. So is this development being, being built primarily for Amazon or is it for UPS? I might have to defer to Carrie for that because I don't actually know the place. Oh, okay. They say the reason for building the road is that the students in the Rock Family College building, when they get out, they want to leave, and to go around Sexton Drive is, a, is dangerous for all those people to go down that way. And also, they said that they need to use the road for trucks to bring in various materials to the many buildings that they have there. The road is actually the least of it. Their plans are to put more buildings on top of the prairie. Or, or Amazon or UPS? Well, I think it's for Amazon, it's but I can't. Oh, yeah, I can't. Confirm and German, that. German logistics company. Yeah, so Amy Shaker and Senator International. Those are the two names that were specifically given to me. So I was like, if I have not looked into their green policies or their, their ethics or anything like that. So perhaps, um, you know, some people starting to bombard them with messages would be a good thing. So the other thing Don is gonna do for us, and if you want information, you can talk to Don because he's gonna help us do FOIAs as well so that okay. we can get more information. So when we uh, started the meeting, we had 62 people online with us um, attending through Zoom. We have about 40 right now. There's a question, where does US Representative Sherry Bustro stand on the issue? Has anybody reached out to her office? Has anyone talked to Rock Valley College or to the students there or to see if they would want to help? Uh, nope, but we'll add that to our list, definitely. Yes. I have a couple questions about the Air Force. One is uh, someone mentioned that the board members are elected. I'd like to know a little more about like, who elected them and like what sort of influence there is over those future decisions. And two, ownership, land ownership, um, and the uh, airport authority, what sort of entity are they legally? Are they like an LLC? Are they a public partnership? You know what I mean? Those kind of things. Yeah, so the, those commissioners are appointed by the mayor of Rockford, the mayor of Chelsea Park, right? The mayor of Luffs Park. Um, so they're appointed positions by our elected officials. I can't speak to, like, I know that our taxpayers pay for that airport. Yeah. So you would think, you know, when you think about public land that we pay taxes for it, we all own that land. Right. I don't, yeah, I don't, I don't, I'm, I'm not versed enough to say that as taxpayers, like, we get, I mean, that's what the whole public hearing and comment section should have been for, like, for us to come and be able to speak out, and we all missed that opportunity. Right. Um, because of the way they handled it. So I don't know, I don't, I can't, yeah, there's a lot of questions I can't answer, unfortunately. No, that's totally fine. Yeah, I just was curious with respect to the land ownership, like if this land is, I, I did a little research and it said that the airport authority is one of the largest, 10 largest landowners yeah. in the area. So I still don't know what that means. Are they, are they holding it in truck? You know what I mean? Like, to what, what extent are they at the, Right, because there isn't a single person that owns the airport, yeah, right? Yeah, you know, you know, I should know, or the natural land institute should know that you have an easement with them. Or it's a special taxing district, just like the other forest preserve district. So there is, I mean, yeah. It's actually owned by the people of Winnebago County. It is? The board, they are the hired hands to run it. But the land is owned by the people of Winnebago yeah. County? Well, that's something like, they don't own the land. They own it? 
our elected representatives appoint the board members, yeah. the board members hire the people that work there, and all that stuff. So, yeah. And then I was just curious if, if there's any plans for proposals to propose this work starting until the spring when a uh, that inventory can be done of the more rare spring floor that hasn't been done ever. And two, if, like what happens to the bumblebee when the queen goes into hibernation? Is she in the prairie and therefore are they going to destroy her? And it's not just a matter of protecting her habitat, she's there. Even though she's right. underground, if you take the ground up, you're, you're moving the bee. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's where our Endangered Species Act is backwards because it only protects the species. It doesn't protect the habitat they live in. So when you remove the habitat, what protections do you have left? I mean, yeah. it's just, it's, yeah. I don't know how to, you know, I'm not, I mean, I've worked on some legislation in the state of Illinois, particularly the bobcat hunting legislation. And like that stuff is so hard to move the needle on, um, but that's federal legislation. So I've talked to National Audubon several times about, you know, how can we like leverage all these big conservation groups that have attorneys, how can we leverage and change the Endangered Species Act to secure our habitat to protect our habitat. Because that needs to happen. Yeah, definitely does. But also, if you remove a piece of soil that has a bee in it, it's hibernating, that's, you're yeah. harming the animal. You're, yeah, you are. Sure. It's the animal. And there, I guarantee you, the bee is in that prayer. Yeah. Where else is it? Does, does the county board have any control over the airport board, or is it just when they appoint them? I don't know the answer to that. I'm guessing McNamara appoints the board members. He can appoint three board members for the airport board. I don't know exactly how they select the rest of them, but I know he can appoint three. I think the chairman for the county also appoints one member of the board for the airport. So the county does have, the county in general has one person. That doesn't mean they control. No, so yeah, that's point what, is three. Yeah. Three. Oh, yeah. They probably be trying to get three appointments. They probably want to walk on the whole. I used to be. Is there a reason why you're not talking to the mayor? Yeah, absolutely. I would recommend, absolutely recommend it. Yeah, reaching out to the mayor. Yeah, I can update that list in the city of Rockford. There's another question here on Zoom. Has there been thoughts about some sort of rally or press conference? We'll put that on our list. We've been doing a lot with the press. Uh, Kim's been sending out a lot of press releases. We've been doing interviews with television, radio. Um, and those are still ongoing. Yeah, so I saw you're going to be on the Not Like NOAC show on Sunday, so yeah. Chicago environmental show. So it streams live on Facebook. Check it out. Uh, in that regard, I came to this meeting. I was, I told me learn through the press what is going on. There's a lot of signs around safe double bird, and I infer from that double bird is about to be destroyed. It's been threatened multiple times. I like that. Uh, what I suggest to you and you know, I is to be very, very specific at least once on exactly what that threat is. We didn't get my chair tonight. There's a road, there might be some buildings, who's going it, we don't know. I would want you to come out and be very, very specific on exactly what the threat is, who's building what, what their plans are. Uh, if you can't get it from the board, the airport. Um, I, I don't know what to say. I mean, is we're, it we're really going to be destroyed, or is it just one end of it that's going to be taken for this road, or what, what's going on? Yeah, I think, well, I think you've worked, Carrie, I've worked on a lot of FOI requests, FOI, FOIA requests, so I would imagine some of the plans may be in there. I don't know. But yeah, so we can definitely work in the work group on coming up with a, a, a message to communicate that to the Any other comments or questions? I'll do one more. Yes. Okay. It's probably not very cozy to what we've done. Um, one of the species that Edward Bell found at Bill Wolfrey in the Western Buffalo. He maintained that he brought in, introduced 
in the feed brought in for the horses and the mules for the army during World War I and the old damn grant. George Bell, his son, disagreed with that. George said there was no proof of that. And he liked to think that buffalo grass was naturally occurring to the Illinois threatened or endangered species. I just went through several biologists in a room, including this guy, and I wondered if anybody had some. This doesn't seem to be a species that you're concerned about. Great for the bumblebee, but there are other things there too. I just yes, wonder, what is that's what true. Is, there are definitely is. other things there. There's definitely um, threatened and endangered plant species there. Again, the protections for those are different, even than uh, uh, species like the rusty patch bumblebee, which you can come in and protect. You can't come in and protect land or plant species if I'm correct, right? Zach, the landowner has rights over those plants and can do whatever they want with them. That's true in this in this case, yeah. Uh, one thing I've been trying to figure out is the, the who the hell owns the, the thing. Yeah. So um, and, and how do we uh, so when it comes to that issue that very issue impacts the, the, the plant question that you're talking about. But at the same time the way that the consultation processes have worked through with the DNR and again the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's uh, we're those protections. It looks like we're kind of beyond that. We need to we need to try to strike a chord. I think with with the airport authority and um, with the governor or with the companies involved in this development. It doesn't seem like we're going to get much help from the state or the feds on that front. There's a suggestion on uh, Zoom. When there's a limit on time in, at the airport meeting, host a press conference outside after <coughs> after the meeting with the rest of the group. Uh, this is common in Chicago when the, where there are strict limits for public comments in city meetings. Mm -hmm. Thank you. A strategy. Yeah. 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 It seems essential that if you have a meeting coming up in just a few weeks, that when there's an event that not for proper of some kind of public event, that there's, there's a presence there about the settlement. I'm not from the area, so I don't know if people have been tabling, but you, somebody said having yeah, press conferences, having some kind of informational thing, because people don't even know. Right. Yeah, obviously, you yeah, know, the road is already half the road. Is already halfway done. Well, there's people that still don't even know what the whole area yeah. is. When, where I had the signs printed, the um, young people that were working there asked me what it was. So I spent 10 minutes talking about what the whole ferry was um, and then asked them to put the sign in their window, which they declined. <laughs> but uh, I tried. Um, but yeah, so I think the more we can communicate and share what this property is, what it means to us, and get more people aware of it, it's going to be helpful too. <coughs> It's going to die on its complexity. It needs to be, as, as he spoke, as well, it needs to be very, very clear what we're protecting, exactly what we're protecting, exactly what part of that land is, is up for, for uh, consideration, and exactly how to get people to the one place, whether it's that, that airport board, or to go out there. I think uh, there are people who would be willing to go out there to that place uh, on that piece of prairie and a whole bunch of people there uh, bring the news, bring the TV, and stand there and have a consultation. Yes. Yeah. 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 I'll go with that. Okay. <laughs> I mean, we'll point this too. I mean, I mean, I, I have to tell you that uh, I, I knew, you know, when Jack told me the threat of arrest, I already told my kids, like, here's where the bail money is. <laughs> and I did, I like told them this, and my oldest was 18, she was like, what are you going to get arrested for? And when I told her, she's like, no, 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 we're coming with you. So, uh, so then I'm like, okay, we'll have to tell grandma. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll have three, three, of, three of us out there. Why not get arrested for something worthwhile? Yeah, I agree. I'll go try. Yeah, good, yeah. Trouble. good trouble. Yeah. Well, I want to say thank you to Jennifer yeah. for all yes. you've done on this project. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
reached out to me directly about a sign. I did have some signs with you tonight. If you're on my little list that I have, if you're not on my list, I, I'm getting more signs and I'll be happy to take your hand. And also, if you want, if you want to be on this planning group, uh, we want to keep it small. We like to keep it probably under 10 people, but we would appreciate having people help us strategize and do actions and get that word out. Especially young people. So I, I actually want to talk to a couple of you after the meeting. So thank you for coming. Oh, young is young. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's not protected. 